and after the first talk as yesterday. So it's my pleasure to introduce Emily Grosvenor from Penn State, and uh, perhaps you've got a copy of her paper which is about models of the sky, solar system galaxy cosmos where models work in the sky. for the invitation. Philosophers of mathematics and science have increasingly insisted on the importance of understanding the amplitude of reasoning, reasoning that adds content and yet is rational in a slightly extended sense. Many of us do this. We understand such reasoning variously, sometimes as a search for the solution of problems and sometimes as a search for the conditions of intelligibility of problematic things. Thus, we are interested in the amplitude of thrust of certain methods, notations, and imaging, the inexhaustibly enigmatic nature of mathematical and natural objects and systems, and the important role played in research by the conjunction of different modes of representation, including iconic images, diagrams, two or three dimensional displays, alongside formal languages and natural language. The primacy of the closed homogeneous systems of deductive logic so limited in their ability to refer, for understanding how we reason is thus challenged. And so too are assumptions about how we integrate mathematics, physical science, and empirical data. One of the central concerns is the nature of models and how they bring the natural world and mathematics into rational relation. <coughs> I begin by observing that productive scientific and mathematical discourse must carry out two distinct tasks in tandem. An analysis or search for conditions of intelligibility or solvability, and a strategy for achieving successful reference. The clear and public indication of what we are talking about, which often involves search for the conditions of intelligibility of problematic objects. Difficulties often arise for mathematicians and scientists because modes of representation apt for analysis may prove to be inapt for successful reference, and vice versa. Sometimes the task of analysis is more difficult and lags behind. Sometimes the task of reference is more difficult. Improvements in reference may lead to improvements in analysis and vice versa, but often the different tasks and attendant modes of representation are hard to reconcile. One of the most effective ways to bring mathematics and the world into rational relation is to combine referential and analytic discourses, a task which inevitably involves the construction of successful models. In his essay, Mathematics, Representation, and Molecular Structure, Robin Henry notes that Nancy Cartwright and Margaret Morrison distinguish strongly between two kinds of models. On the one hand, philosophers like Boss von Frossen pay most attention to theoretical models which, as in model theory, are structures that satisfy a set of sentences in the formal languages. Such structures themselves organized as a language, so that the sentences of the formal language are true when interpreted in terms of the object language. On the other hand, philosophers like Cartwright and Morrison remind us of the importance of representational models, where the relevant relation is not satisfaction, but representation. Like the iconic images that represent models, this one is benzene. Different models or modes of discourse bring out different aspects of the target system. Those that help us to elaborate theory and the abstract, highly theoretical networks that lead to scientific explanation typically differ from those that help us to denote, don't, to, denote to single out the intended target system. The relation between meta-theory and object theory is isomorphism, but isomorphism leaves, leaves us adrift in a plurality of possible structures. And scientists cannot allow themselves to drift in that way. Henry writes, we know that equations are offered not in isolation, but in conjunction with text or speech. This linguistic context is what determines their denotation, 
and serves to make representation a determinate, non-stipulative relation that may admit of degrees of non-trivial success and failure. Natural languages like English, French, or German equip their speakers with abilities to refer to their surroundings, and we can understand how equations can represent if they borrow a reference from this linguistic context. In sum, theoretical models are too general. They cannot help us refer properly to the things and systems we're trying to investigate. And referential models are too limited. They can't offer the explanatory depth that theory provides. My intention in this essay is to show how models of the solar system, our galaxy and closest galaxy neighbor, Andromeda, and our cosmos have historically proved to be composites. In order to be effective, they must combine discursive and representational modeling in an uneasy but fruitful union. We need a thoughtful account of the variety of strategies that scientists use to construct such composite models. The relative stability of successful models makes scientific theorizing possible. And the residual instability, which no logician can erase because of the heterogeneity of the discourses, leaves open the possibility of further analysis and more accurate and precise reference. So one of my main points is that models are revisable, not only because they are approximations that leave out information, but also because they must combine both reference and analysis. So they must be an uneasy combination of different kinds of discourse. To inquire into the conditions of intelligibility of formal or natural things, we may decompose them in various ways, asking what components they have, and how these components are related, or asking what attributes go into their complex concepts. We can also ask what laws they satisfy. But in order to refer properly to a thing or system, we have to grasp it first as what it is, a whole relatively stable in time and space, its unity governing the complex structure that helps to characterize it. Things and systems, both natural and formal, have symmetries. And since periodicity is symmetry in time, so do natural processes. The importance of symmetry was uh, brought out to me by reading Boss von Frost's book on symmetry. <coughs> Carbon molecules as they throb, snowflakes as they form, and solar systems as they rotate exhibit symmetries and periodicities that are key to understanding what they are and how they work. Thus, the shape in space and time of a system or thing is not, as Aristotle once claimed, a merely accidental feature. On the contrary, symmetry and periodicity are a kind of generalization of identity. They are the hallmark of stable existence. Symbolic modes of representation seem to be most useful for abstract analysis. And iconic modes of representation for reference, that's just a rule of thumb, a representation of shape is often an important vehicle for referring. This is an oversimplification, however. Tabulated data and data displayed to exhibit, for example, linear correlations have both symbolic and iconic dimensions, and most icons come equipped with indices that relate them to symbolic notation. Thus, we should expect models to be both symbolic and iconic. And then it is rewarding to ask, how do those modes of representation interact on the page and in thought? In the late 16th century and through the 17th century, the problem of reference in astronomy is important but less pressing than problems of analysis. The latter include debate over whether the sun or the earth occupies the center of the cosmos and whether heavenly bodies move in circles at a constant speed or not. However, the objects in question are clearly defined. We stand on the Earth, the sun and the moon are large, brilliant objects in the sky, the planets are salient and distinctive in their movements. To refer in one sense, all we have to do is point. But the very act of pointing out an item in the solar system is of tracking. Such items move. So the question is how to characterize the movement. How to, so the question, how to characterize that movement, must also arise. Tracking the objects of the solar system required in the 16th century a compass and a sextant or quadrant. Tycho Brahe used these instruments in an unusually consistent and careful fashion. He
he created new instruments that were larger in scale and more precise. He calibrated his instruments regularly and measured their positions in small temporal intervals all along a given orbit with unprecedented accuracy. Rahe's tables of planetary motion, the Rudolphine tables, meant to supplant the 13th century Alphonsine tables, were published in a quarter of a century after his death in 1627 by his collaborator Kepler. The tables are the model, along with Kepler's ellipse. What do I mean by this claim? Perusing the pages of the Rudolphine ta tables, we see that the issues of reference and analysis cannot be thoroughly disentangled. First, from the way Kepler sets up the tables, it's clear he is using a heliocentric system with elliptical planetary orbits. This is noteworthy because Tycho remained opposed to the heliocentric hypothesis till the end of his life, and he died before Kepler worked out his laws of motion. The claim that the orbit of Mars is elliptical is first published in Kepler's Astronomia Nova, 1609. Thus, the tables embody and display two theoretical challenges to Aristotelian Ptolemaic astronomy, which Tycho himself never made. Second, it was the very accuracy of Tycho's data that persuaded Kepler finally to abandon his devotion to the circle and to search for other simple mathematical forms, at least at last settling on the ellipse. Unprecedentedly accurate and frequent tracking forced a change in conceptualization. Of course, it was also the highly theoretical mathematics of Euclid and Apollonius, newly available, translated, and edited in the Renaissance that offered a repertoire of forms to Kepler. His famous ellipse from the Astronomia Nova is given below. As is well known, Galileo pounced upon the refracting telescope almost as soon as it was invented, made improvements to it, and turned it on the heavens. Kepler was an enthusiastic supporter of Galileo, and himself used the telescope to look at the moons of Jupiter and the surface of the moon. Sixty years later, Newton built the first re reflecting telescope using a concave primary mirror and a flat diagonal secondary mirror. This invention impressed both Barrow and Huygens and led to Newton's induction into the Royal Society. From then on, improvements in our ability to refer to the objects of astronomy have depended on improvements in the material composition, size, and placement of telescopes. Galaxies and galaxy clusters, if they, are not if they were not simply invisible, were at first, in those days, mere smudges on the night sky. A few of them are visible as smudges to the naked eye. Either they were not recorded, or they were noted as nebulae, clouds, whose structure was just barely visible in the 19th century, and whose composition remained mysterious until well into the 20th. Like clouds, they seem to have no determinate shape. The discernment of galactic shape played an important role in the development of 20th century astronomy and cosmology. In Book One of Newton's Principia, Kepler's second law, that planets sweep out equal sectors in equal times. They accelerate as they get closer to the sun and decelerate as they get further away. This proved in Newtonian fashion in Proposition One, and Kepler's ellipse is the centerpiece of the diagram that accompanies the proof of the inverse square law, Proposition 11. This model is a geometric shape. In this case, however, what is modeled is only a fragment of the solar system, which consists of two bodies, a subsystem, the sun and a single planet. One might suppose, then, the appropriate geometric model would simply be two points. However, a quick look at figure one, which is actually figure two, so, this page, <laughs> because I kept adding pictures to this paper. A quick look at this figure, this, which is really the two pages from the Principia, discredits this idea. This model of the sun and a planet to exhibit to, to exhibit the integrity of the system and to serve as the basis for building back more of the complexity of the known system with its sun, six planets, and various moons and later models, you can't just have two points. 
Rather, the model must include the spatial and temporal symmetries involved in the motions of the two bodies. And therefore, as we learn from Proposition 11, it must express the dynamical nature of the interaction between them. Proposition 11 demonstrates that if a body in orbit around the center of force traces out an ellipse, then the force must obey an inverse square law. The geometrical array that we see in figure one in, in this, on this page represents a planet at P in elliptical orbit around the sun at S, located at one of the two foci of the ellipse. Note that significant points and therefore certain line segments and areas they delimit on the geometrical construction, their significance is both geometrically and physically motivated, are labeled by letters and that this array is surrounded by prose and Latin, as well as proportions and equations involving the letters of those lettered points. The ellipse therefore appears as a palimpsest. It is at the same time a Euclidean Apollonian mathematical object with one set of internal articulations useful for discovering its mathematical properties, a tracking device for Kepler as he finishes compiling the tables with Tycho's compass and sextant or quadrant, and therefore just an outline, since a trajectory is just a projected line across the sky. And finally as well, Newton's construction, with a superimposed set of articulations for displaying temporal, physical, dynamical properties. That final layer turns the array into the representation of a dynamical system, as the center of force is shown to obey the inverse square law. The ellipse thus becomes a model where the demands of reference and the demands of theorization are, in Book 1, Proposition 11, happily reconciled. All the same, the multiple roles the ellipse is forced to play there, in a sense, destabilizes the geometry and will ultimately lead to its re expression in the Leibnizian, Bernoullian, Eulerian form of a differential equation. In Book 3 of the Principia, Newton elaborates his theory and enriches his model, building in further complexity to show that he can account for further tabular evidence compiled by other astronomers around Europe. He accounts for perturbations in the orbit of the moon in terms of the gravitational pull of both the Earth and the Sun, and goes on to account for the tides. He explains the orbits of comets as they intermittently visit the solar system, and he shows that not only the other planets, but also the moons of Jupiter, obey the generalized law of universal gravitation. The problems left for the next generation by Newton's book three are therefore, in his opinion, Newton's opinion, puzzles of normal science, and Kuhn seems to, in some of his writings, concur in Newton's assessment. In this account of scientific process, progress, the puzzles of reference are to locate and measure the movements of more and more astronomical items, and to make sure that they accord with Newton's three laws of motion and the law of universal gravitation. Existing theory expressed in the formal, highly geometrical idioms of the Principia will cover and explain observation and provide and prove adequate to solving the puzzles of theory, which include, first and foremost, how to move from the two-body problem to the three-body problem to the n-body problem. Newton's law of universal gravitation states that, in the case of two bodies, the force acting on each body is directly proportional to the product of masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their centers and acts along the straight line which joins them. And he also shows that gravity acts on the bodies when they are solid spheres in just the same way it would act on point particles having the same masses as the spheres and locate at their centers. This allows the formulation of the n-body problem which models a group of heavenly bodies. Consider n point masses in three-dimensional Euclidean space whose initial positions and velocities are specified at a time t0, and suppose the force of attraction obeys Newton's law of universal gravitation, then how will the system evolve? This means that we have to find a global solution of the initial value problem for the differential equation describing the n-body problem. But here is the irony. The differential equations of the two-body problem are easy to solve. Newton's difficulties with his much more geometrical formulation in propositions 39 to 41 indicate the superiority of the idiom of differential equations here 
he could have solved the problem a lot better if he'd had differential equations. However, for n larger than 2, no other case can be solved completely. One might have thought that reducing the models to differential equations, as it is done successively in the work of Leibniz, Supernulli, Euler, other people on the continent, would have made the solution of these centrally important problems about the solar system straightforward. But on the contrary, the equations articulated the complexity of the higher dimensional phase spaces needed to express the physical situation, subsystems in the solar system, accurately, as well as the great difficulty of finding complete solutions. The severe difficulty of the n-body problem drove the development of physics for many decades. The work of Leibniz, Euler, Lagrange, Laplace, and Hamilton replaced Newton's laws with a single postulate, the variation principle, and replaced Newton vectorial mechanics with an analysis in which the, form, the fundamental quantities are scalars rather than vectors, and the dynamical relations are arrived at by a systematic process of differentiation. Lagrange's mécanique analytique introduced the Lagrangian form of the differential equations of motion for a system with n degrees of freedom and generalized coordinates, q, i, i, 1 to n. This rewriting of the equations allowed physicists to choose whatever coordinates were most useful for describing the system, increasing the simplicity, elegance, and scope of the mathematics. But of course, in another obvious sense, the very complexity of the object, the solar system, forced the development of physics. Since the solar system was the only thing it could be studied as a celestial mechanical system by the instruments available at the time. The main features of that complexity were already apparent to everyone. Around the sun, there are many planets with moons around some planets. Uranus was identified by the important astronomer Herschel in 1781, and the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter was correctly identified at the beginning of the 19th century. Moreover, there were no important advances in telescopy until the mid-19th century. So the controversies and advances apropos the mathematical models were notably theoretical and analytical. The accumulation of these developments was the publication of Laplace's five-volume Mécanique Céleste, where, with immense mathematical skill, he further elaborated these results into analytic methods for calculating the motions of the planets. In the early 1830s, Hamilton discovered that if we regard a certain integral as a function of the initial and final coordinate values, this principal function satisfies two first-order partial differential equations. Jacobi showed how Hamilton's approach to solve dynamical ordinary differential equations in terms of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation that are simplified and generalized by Klebsch. Helmholtz's publication of On the Conservation of Force, where what, what he meant by force we would really say now was energy, in 1847 was the culmination of efforts to find a mechanical equivalent for heat in the new domain of thermodynamics and to integrate a theory of mechanics, heat, light, electricity, and magnetism by means of the notion of energy rather than gravitational force. Clausius reformulated the work of Carnot and introduced the second law of thermodynamics in 1850, as well as the notion of entropy in 1865. In an 1870 lecture, he introduced the Virial theorem which states that in an assemblage of particles in gravitationally bound stable statistical equilibrium, the average kinetic energy is equal to half the average potential energy. Whereas measuring the potential energy of a system requires the ability to measure its mass, measuring the kinetic energy depends on the measurement of the motions of the body in the system. In the case of astronomical bodies, it's much easier to measure the latter than the former. So the Virial theorem came to assume an important role in 20th century cosmology when it was applied to galaxies and galaxy clusters. However, in 1870, these objects were barely discernible. They were referred to as clouds, because that was how they appeared. Many astronomers supposed they would prove to have interesting <coughs> internal structure after Laplace in 1796, following the speculations of Kant. 
proposed the nebular hypothesis that the solar system emerged from a cloud of swirling gas. Sorry, dust. Thus, the issues of model, the issue of models for the heavens reverts then to the problem of reference, and the work of the astronomers Herschel and Parsons, Earl of Rossi, become paramount. The path from the detection of nebulae as cloudy smudges within the sole island galaxy of the Milky Way to the recognition that many of them were in fact other galaxies far distant from our own with complex internal structure encompassing hundreds of billions of stars is long and winding. Messier cataloged the closest galaxy Andromeda as object M31. Messier 31 in 1764. Herschel estimated that it was about 2,000 times further away from us than Sirius, which is one of the stars closest to us. Herschel's large reflecting telescopes produced a dramatic increase in the ability of astronomers to watch the heavens. In 1789, he proposed that nebulae were made up of self-luminous nebular, nebular material. He made hundreds of drawings of them, looking for significant morphological differences or patterns of development, as he searched for evidence of his nebular hypothesis that clusters of stars may be formed from nebulae. Herschel's son John revised his father's catalog for the Northern Hemisphere and established a catalog for the Southern Hemisphere as well, and kept alive the question of the composition of nebulae. What were they made of? Alongside tabulations of positions, astronomical observations were drawn by hand. John Herschel was known for his meticulous sketches, which he hoped could be used in series and by future astronomers to determine change and motion in celestial configurations. In 1845, William Parson, Earl of Rossi, built the largest telescope in the world. Its specular mirror was six feet in diameter with a focal length of over four feet. He hoped to discover some of the fine structure of Herschel's nebulae. Soon after the telescope was set up, next to a smaller one that was equatorially mounted, he pointed at Messier 51, what we know now call the Whirlpool Galaxy, a bright face on spiral with a companion, and discovered both its spiral swirled structure and its companion. There on the next page is his picture, drawn by hand. The discernment of the shape of the nebula was decisive. He sketched it repeatedly in two steps. First, he used a smaller telescope to scale the drawing, and then the large one to fill in the details. Herschel saw Rossi's sketches presented at a meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science and was enthusiastically supportive. These drawings were later improved and engraved so that the nebula was represented in negative as black on a white background. So in Rossi's research project, the production of an astronomical image was an interplay between what was seen through the telescope and what was carefully sketched by lamplight by Rossi and various assistants, thereafter to be refashioned as an engraving. This was the first model of a galaxy. In the last two decades of the 19th century, astronomers solved various technical problems. How to keep the telescope and camera pointing in the right direction over a period of time, for example, and profited from the introduction of dry plate photography, so that by 1887, a consortium of 20 observatories could produce a comprehensive astronomical atlas from photographic images. Comparison of photographs with drawings rapidly made clear how variable sketches had been as records of celestial objects, especially nebulae. Once astronomers had a firmer grasp of what they were trying to look at, the next step was to estimate how far away they were, and then to combine that knowledge with star counts and further estimations of stellar velocities within a given galaxy. This takes us into the 20th century. Up to this point, the application of classical mechanics to these mysterious objects had really only been a pipe dream. In the first decades of the 20th century, it became a true research program. Once nebulae were acknowledged to be extragalactic objects, much larger and further away than anyone in the 19th century had suspected. And ever more powerful telescopes were able to track their motions and resolve their images. In the meantime, however, classical mechanics was being transformed, and the ensuing theoretical disputes affected the work of astronomers as well. So as I was trying to uh, argue a little bit earlier, the development of Newtonian mechanics was not normal science. 
in Kuhn's sense. The emergence of electromagnetic theory, and this comes later, the independent development of chemistry, and the study of thermodynamics were shaped by a growing awareness that in different domains, forces other than gravity were important and demanded codification. And that the notation of differential equations, the study of symmetries, the category of energy as opposed to force should be central to mechanics. However, the most direct challenge to Newtonian mechanics, as we all know, came from Einstein's special and general theories of relativity, which explored the consequences of the equivalence of inertial frames, special relativity, and of accelerated frames, general relativity, given the constant speed of light. Einstein proposed an equivalence between matter and energy, a four-dimensional space-time continuum curved locally and perhaps globally at the, by the matter and energy located in it, a dilation or slowing down of the passage of time experienced by items moving close to the speed of light, and the notion of a light cone as a formal limit and cosmic causal limit action. It was clear that these revisions of classical mechanics would have significant consequences for astronomy, certain aspects of which were beginning to change into modern scientific cosmology. In the late 18th and early 19th century, cosmology had remained merely speculative, driven by the metaphysical certainty of Leibniz and Goethe that in nature, everything strives. However, relativity theory did not impinge immediately on the study of galaxies. Rather, it was the study of the redshift of the electromagnetic radiation emitted from stars and the characterization of sepia variables, both more closely related to problems of reference and taxonomy than to theoretical speculation, which moved the study of galaxies into the heart of modern cosmology. The astronomer Edwin Hubble studied galaxies by analyzing the emission spectra of the light emitted by the stars. He noted that standard patterns of spectral lines were shifted toward the red end of the spectrum. This he interpreted as a Doppler shift, which we know from ordinary experience as the lowering of the tone of a train whistle when it rushes past us. That is, he took it as evidence that the galaxies, most of them, were receding from us, not Andromeda. His famous law, proposed in 1929, posits a linear relation defined by the Hubble constant between recessional velocity and distance, so that a measurement of redshift could be used to give an accurate estimate of how far away from us the galaxy lies. He also used standard stars called Cepheid variables, whose period of variation and absolute luminosity are tightly related as signposts. In combination, these factors allowed him to see that nebulae were extragalactic and to estimate their distances from us. Thus, it was only during the 1920s that the scale of the universe began to dawn on astronomers. In 1936, Hubble wrote his influential book, The Realm of Nebulae, that wrote in his influential book that valuable information has been assembled concerning the scale of nebular distances, the general features of nebulae, such as their distant dimensions, luminosities, and masses, their structure and stellar contents, their large-scale distribution in space, and the curious velocity of distance. From that point on, scientists were puzzled about how to address the mismatch between astrophysical theory, originally based on the behavior of objects in the solar system, and the measurement of celestial systems. The orbital speeds of the stars and galaxies should be determined by the total mass of the galaxy pulling on them, and should diminish in proportion to their distance from the center. But stars on the outskirts of galaxies go much too fast. The laws of Newtonian physics predict that such high speeds to pull the galaxy apart. Thus, in order to explain the stability of the galaxy, scientists either had to assume that there is much more matter in the galaxy than we can see in the form of stars like our sun, or that Newton's laws must be revised for large systems. In 1937, the astronomer Fritz Fahey took issue with Hubble on a number of points. He announced at the beginning of his paper on the masses of nebulae and clusters of nebulae that the determination of the masses of extragalactic nebulae was a central problem for astrophysics. Masses of nebulae, until recently, were estimated either from the luminosities of nebulae or from their internal rotations, he noted, and then asserted that both these methods of reckoning nebular masses were unreliable. 
The adding up of observed luminosities gave figures that were clearly too low. And the models used for reckoning mass on the basis of observed internal motions were too indeterminate. Better models were needed. Not least because Zwicky was convinced that in addition to luminous matter, galaxies and galaxy clusters included dark matter. He wrote, we must know how much dark matter is incorporated in nebulae in the form of cool and cold stars, macroscopic and microscopic solid bodies and gases. It would be anachronistic to read Zwicky here as supporting or even introducing the current hypothesis of dark matter, since he used the term simply to indicate that he thought that our telescopes could not see some or most of what is actually included in a galaxy or galaxy cluster. There was luminous matter which we can detect and dark matter which we can't. This made it all the more important to be able to estimate the mass of a galaxy or galaxy cluster on the basis of the internal movements of its visible components. Thus we, could, thus we would have to improve upon the mechanical models used so that those estimates could become more accurate. He discussed in that paper four kinds of models, the first of which, Hubble's model, he dismissed. In the realm of nebulae, Hubble argued that from observations of internal rotations, good values of the mass of a galaxy should be derived. He wrote, apart from uncertainties in the dynamical picture, the orbital motion of a point in the equatorial plane of a nebula should be determined by the mass of material inside the orbit. That mass can be calculated in much the same way in which the mass of the sun is found from the orbital direction of the, the orbital motion of the Earth or of the other planets. However, he expressed some doubts about how to interpret available data about both galaxies and galaxy clusters. Zwicky diagnosed the problem in terms of the indeterminacy of the mechanical model, for one can make the assumption that the internal viscosity of a nebula was ne negligible or that it was very great. In the former case, the observed angular velocities would not allow the computation of the mass of the system. In the latter case, nebula would rotate like a solid body, regardless of what its total mass and distribution of that mass may be. For intermediate and more realistic cases, Zwicky argued, it's not possible to derive the masses of nebulae from observed rotation without the use of additional information. If, for example, there were a central highly viscous core with distant outlying little interacting components, one would need information about that viscosity and about the distribution of the outlying bodies. And he dismissed the analogy with the solar system as superficial. So he went on to propose three other possible models for calculating the mass of a galaxy or galaxy cluster. The second approach was to apply the burial theorem. If a galaxy cluster, such as the coma cluster, was stationary, then the burial theorem of classical mechanics gives the total mass of the cluster in terms of the average square of the velocities of the individual nebulae which constitute this cluster. He argued that the burial theorem would work for the system even if the nebulae are not evenly distributed throughout the cluster. But what if the cluster was not stationary? A brief calculation showed that given the velocities, the burial theorem predicts that ultimately it will fly apart, which is odd, since then there would be no galaxy clusters at all. So there must be internebular material whose nature and density should be further studied. Zwicky concluded that the virial theorem as applied to clusters of nebulae provides for a test of the validity of the inverse square law of gravitational forces because the distances are so enormous and these clusters are the largest known aggregates of matter. He also remarked that it would be desirable to apply the virial theorem to individual galaxies but that it was just too difficult to measure the velocities of individual stars as it was at that point in time. He treated this practical limitation as if he could not foresee its resolution. The next model was that of gravitational lensing, a direct application of Einstein's theory of general relativity. However, this was a merely speculative proposal. It wasn't carried out observationally until 1979. And the final model was an extrapolation of ordinary statistical mechanics Analogous to those which result in Boltzmann's principle. Zwicky's motivation in this section seemed to be to find a theory that explained large scale features of the universe without resorting to the kind of cosmological account, like the Big Bang theory, which he opposed, given his general disapproval of Hubble. Hubble wasn't that crazy about it either. Zwicky concluded 
it's not necessary as yet to call on evolutionary processes to explain why the representation of nebular types and clusters differs from that in the general field. Here, as in the interpretation of other astronomical phenomena, the idea of evolution may have been called upon prematurely. It cannot be overemphasized in this connection that systematic and irreversible evolutionary changes in the domain of astronomy have thus far in no case been definitively established. For Twiggy, part of what was at stake was whether our model of the whole cosmos should be evolutionary or not. Now we come almost to the end of the paper. In the next five minutes. Thus, at the end of the 1930s, two important astronomers who had access to the same observational data on the largest material objects in the universe found themselves associated with two radically opposed views on the direction cosmology should take. Yet they were both equally puzzled by the discrepancy in estimating the mass of these large objects, in estimations of the mass of these large objects. The evidence produced by star counting and galaxy counting and the results of mechanically plausible models in the Newtonian style that calculate mass on the basis of the motion of stars in galaxies and of galaxies within clusters simply did not agree. So the choice of theory could not be determined by observational results, and the clash of observational results could not be reconciled with theory. A quarter century later, astronomers were finally in a position to measure the velocity of components of a galaxy, and so to calculate the mass of the galaxy. Astronomers already had reliable evidence that a galaxy rotates about its center based on the gradient in the stellar absorption lines on the major axis and the lack of such a gradient on the minor axis. If a galaxy were a mechanical system, like the solar system, then we should expect that the velocity of its outer region should decrease as Kepler and then Newton and Clausius demonstrated. The longer periods of revolution of Jupiter and Neptune and the shorter periods of Mercury and Venus can be accurately predicted. Even such a distinguished astronomer as Besto Slipher continued to characterize the radial velocity data of Andromeda and the Sombrero Galaxy as planetary in the 1950s. In the early 1960s, Vera Rubin and her graduate students made careful studies of the velocities of stars on the outskirts of Andromeda, because Rubin was interested in where galaxies actually end. They found that the galaxy rotation curve did not dimish, diminish <coughs> as expected, but remained flat. You can see the data points there. In 1970, she and W. Kent Ford reported new data on Andromeda, profiting from the identification of almost 700 individual emission regions, as well as the use of image intensifiers that reduce observation times by a factor of 10. The edges of Andromeda did not move slower, they moved just as quickly as the inner regions. In 1980, with Ford and Donard, she repeat, reported similar data for 21 for the galaxies. While in the earlier paper she was reticent about drawing explicit conclusions, in this paper she writes, most galaxies exhibit rising rotational velocities in the last measured velocity. Only for the very largest galaxies are the rotation curves flat. This form for the rotation curves implies that the mass is not centrally condensed, but that significant mass is located at large r. The integral mass is increasing at least as fast as R. The mass is not converging to a limiting mass at the edge of the optical image. The conclusion is inescapable that non-luminous matter exists beyond the optical galaxy. Since then, her observations have proved consistent with the measurement velocities in a wide variety of other galaxies. Scientists remain divided about how to address the mismatch between astrophysical theory originally modeled on our solar system and data on larger systems. Proponents of the abductive thesis of dark matter argue that in order to explain the stability of a galaxy or a galaxy cluster, we have to assume that there is much more matter in the galaxy than we can see in the form of stars like our own. Other scientists are unhappy with a the scientific theory based on something that, up till now, has re resisted the detection altogether. The research program MOND, Modified Newtonian Dyma Dynamics, proposes instead that we revise Newtonian mechanics to explain the uniform velocity of rotation of galaxies. 
Since its inception 30 years ago, proponents have tried various adjustments and refinements, refinements without winning general acceptance. So it seems that we must choose between ad hoc adjustment of principles for postulating a new kind of matter we can't detect, clearly a new kind of model is called for, which will bring reference and theoretical analysis into novel and more fruitful alignment.
there's two examples that come to mind that I understand better from chemistry that I, that I was working on, let's say, about a decade ago. And one was the, uh, the hypothesis of a complex molecule that arose in organic chemistry, and uh, I analyzed a paper about this, uh, the, the construction, the artificial construction of this molecule. And at a certain point, it's associated with a very highly colored, highly detailed computer simulation of the molecule, which the chemist that I was writing the paper with said, that's a kind of rhetorical ploy to get you to accept that this molecule exists and looks like that. So the image is in it. So, you know, be careful. <coughs> um, and so that's, you know, that's how it could be misleading. But then, it's also true that um, in, in another chemical case study, there, there's this constant back and forth between the construction of the model of, let's say, a particular, a particular molecule, and then new incoming data, an adjustment of the model, adjustment of the differential equation, new incoming data, and that that process seems rational. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to be, I mean, that it, it, it's, not, it's not just ad hoc adjustment. You had to have the you had to have the model, which was both you know diagram differential equations, in order to look for certain kinds of specific data. Then the data come in, then you adjust the model. Then you're in a position to look for some more specific data. So it's a kind of fine tuning, and that seems to be uh, legitimate.
You can use natural language to talk about anything. However, of course, there's limits to how natural language allows you to talk about stuff, which is why we resort to the highly specialized, highly specific, highly computational languages that we use in the sciences. So, <clears throat> if Henry's point is true, which is that in addition to, for example, let's go back to Newton because that's the example I use like the best, because I understand it the best. The, you got the geometry, you have the nascent algebra, you have the nascent infinitesimal analysis, and you have the new dynamics superimposed on each other, but framed by natural language, in this case Latin. Um, can you, even in the mathematics textbook, get rid of the natural language? No. Because, first of all, what else is going to bring those different discourses into relationship with each other? And also, there's a kind of reference that you need to do, especially in the sciences, perhaps also in that, another issue, that you have to use natural language in order to carry on. And, and believe me, you know, the, the, the more I, I continue with this stuff, the, the, the mismatch between natural language and any of these technical languages is really striking. I'm curious about what was written at the end of page two. Yeah. 
seems to require a variety of what looks like ad hoc adjustments to the and then the problem with the, the dark matter hypothesis is that they keep looking and looking and looking yeah. for it, and, and so far nobody's been able to he, find <laughs> something that you know would plausibly be it. Yeah. yeah. Are you using huh? Wait. For instance, we can track in passports or whatever. There are many hypotheses. But no one has been confirmed. Or well, even. Yeah, very far from being confirmed. Yeah. Um, this is a speculation. Is a speculation. Yeah, yeah, highly speculative, in my opinion. Yeah. Maybe. In some sense, dark matter and dark energy makes no difference according to the fact that uh, energy is equivalent to mass. So it may be dark energy, dark matter, dark something. Oh, but dark energy is opposed to cosmological. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. Sure. So, you know, in, in summary, what I'd like you to guess at this paper is um, more philosophical talk about how heterogeneous discourses are brought into rational relation instead of trying to make the heterogeneity go away. No. Admit that they're heterogeneous and ask how they, they work together rationally, which I think is part of, uh, you know, amplitude reasoning. And then um, when they contribute to the instability of models, what does that look like? What happens? What happens when the mismatch? Uh, contributes to the breakdown of the model. I just think that's an interesting question. Yeah. Interesting questions.